I have been outside this week, as I'm sure you have all been outside this week, just laughing in that sun and watching the world unfold. The, the, today I watched the daffodils actually creep up about an inch over the course of the day. Sadly, the weeds were doing the same thing, but uh, it's just beautiful. Spring is here and uh, let's get started and enjoy it. Um, okay, here we go. As long as we're working. One, two, three. Okay. So as we saw today, um, spring is here. You may have seen crocuses in your garden. You may have seen them in the neighborhood. I saw aconites in full bloom and uh, it just makes your heart sing, makes your heart sing. So we're gonna be taking our singing hearts and looking at things we're gonna do to get our garden ready for spring. So this is what I'm gonna touch on today. We're gonna start off talking about cleaning our pots and then once they're clean, what goes in them and what a soil actually is and what mulch is. After that, we're gonna talk about cleaning up our yard and getting it ready for planting. Um, gardening in the spring to me is a little bit like getting your room ready to paint. Spring comes, you say, I wanna change this room and I wanna change it from this color to vibrant raspberry. And you run to get your paint can, but you go, no, 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 no. First, I've got to wash the walls. Then I've got to take the switch plates off. I've got to tape the tape all around the baseboard, tape the trim. And once you've gone through all that, and if you're not exhausted, um, it's time to get your paint out. And gardening's really no different. You need to take the time to get ready so that your garden and your soil can be the best it can be. So we're going to look at your, your, what you're planting in what you, um, in both terms of both gardens, pots, and soil. And we're gonna look at our garden tools and what we can do to make them the best they can be. And then look at what we're gonna do as far as pruning goes um, to make our shrubbery look great. So before you start anything, you're gonna to have to make sure your pots are clean. And why do we do that? Well, the first thing we wanna do is make sure we're getting rid of any diseases that might've been carried over from last year. Give them a really good clean. Terracotta pots can often absorb the mineral components, so they may be full of salts, and that's what you see in this picture, is a lot of um, uh, mineral salts on the pot, but you wanna use a stiff brush, um, maybe a Brillo pad or something and get that off. Um, don't use cleaning agents that are going to absorb into your containers, and you can use anything. It doesn't have to be terracotta, fiberglass, cement. You can plant up anything you want, you just want to make sure that it's clean before you start. So give everything a good, good, shrub, a good clean with a biodegradable um, cleaning agent. Give it a good soak, get it cleaned out. If you can soak it in your bathtub or at least give it a good wipe and make sure um, when you're done that, wipe it down with a nine to one unscented bleach just to make sure you've killed off everything. Give it a good final rinse and you're ready to go. So what are you gonna plant in? Well, you can plant in pretty much anything you want. Um, up in the top corner, you'll see different, if you're planting vegetables, and many of us are moving into vegetables and our victory gardens during this COVID era, um, make sure that you're planting in something that is safe to eat. If you're planting up a oil barrel to look like Annie Franny and Uncle John, make sure you plant flowers in it and not carrots because the oil residue will still be in those barrels. And you can see on the top right corner of your screen what you're checking for on pots, that plastic pots that you might wanna use for food. What is acceptable and what is not acceptable. And you know, plant in anything, bathtubs, toilets, but again, make sure they're clean. I wanted to give you an idea of what pot sizes are. So when you're dealing with your soil, you have an idea if you're purchasing soil, what you're buying. So this is a five and a half or seven and a half liter pot. So there you go, about 18 inches across the top. And that will give you an idea of what you're looking at when you're purchasing soil for your garden. But if you're gonna purchase soil, we need to ask ourselves why. So, what goes back into this nice clean pot now? Well, we can start off quite simply and put last year's soil back in. Not your best choice, but doable. Um, a 
a soil will be good for a season or two. It'll deplete itself of all its minerals as it goes along, but you can do it. If you're gonna do that, first pull back any mulch that you might have on your soil, break the soil up, get rid of any roots and stuff that might be in there. Maybe you can put it through a sieve and then you're ready to go. Not your best choice, but certainly doable because garden uh, soil can be expensive. Second best option, if we're gonna go up the rung of uh, a ladder of fertility, take half the soil out and dump it in your garden. Take the other half, dump it in a bigger pot and mix it with half, half and half, 50-50 of um, new, new potting mix. Now, when you're looking at your potting mixes, many of you will have seen things like this. So this is miracle Grow. We see this everywhere in the store. And it has on the back your basic chemical components. Pretty straightforward, nitrogen, potassium, um, but we're going to circle back and talk about why miracle Grows may not be your best choice. You can up your ante a little bit and look for a potting soil that has microcorzial fungus and different nutrients in it that I don't know if you can get close enough to see those ingredients that are going to give you a better potting soil mix. And if you're going to be buying potting soil, buy the best you can afford. Um, but really read the contents and see, make, make a good choice as to what might work for you. Um, next best choice, take your soil and add some compost to it. Uh, mix in a little bit of compost. You're getting all those microorganisms and everything growing in, your, growing in your soil because it's the microorganisms that are breaking down um, the nutrients in your soil. And that is what your plant is taking from it. If we go back to the first level of this ladder, whoops, hang on. If we go back to the first level of this ladder, we've got um, just soil that's not, just a second. The, oh no, the phone throws you off. Um, sorry. We, we go back to um, very plain soil that's not got a lot of nutrients and, and what have you in it. So by adding something that's got more nutrients, you're gonna make that soil last a little bit longer. When you're looking at, at bagged soil though, you're gonna see things like organic and natural and just what do those things mean? You really have to dig into that a little bit. You know, fun fact, if it says that the, the manure is organic manure, well, it needed to be an organic cow. And uh, that's not always the case, but what goes in one side has to come out the other side. Um, what? There, can you? Thank you, sorry. So step three on this ladder, we're adding perlite to give your soil air porosity. That's going to allow the roots of your plant to get into the soil and be able to pull out as many of the nutrients as possible. You're going to add vermiculite. Vermiculite is going to hold the moisture. And when you're planting in a pot, um, you're going to go through your water quite quickly. So you want something that's going to have water retention to it. So vermiculite, peat moss, that sort of thing is a good choice. Um, maybe you make your own compost. If you do make your own compost, you can make a compost tea with that, which is just adding some water to the compost and then watering your plants with that as well, which is a really good option. Um, you want very diverse microorganisms and nutrients happening inside that pot so that your plant can grow to be the best it can be. Um, when you want, talking about the, the first level, again, if you use a synthetic fertilizer, so a, micro, um, um, a miracle grow, for example, you're going to have to be watering it regularly because you're using a synthetic fertilizer. The synthetic fertilizer is watering the plant. It's gonna make that plant grow. Yes, it's gonna be beautiful. It's gonna be lush. You're gonna have lots of flowers, but you're not doing anything for the soil. The second bag I showed you had or was an organic fertilizer with organic matter in it and microorganisms in it. And it's the microorganisms that are um, feeding the soil so that the soil can feed the plant. So you see the difference here. You've got synthetic fertilizer just feeding the plant, or you've got organic fertilizers. So your compost and the different things you can add to your soil, your organic matter, 
that's going to create nutrients for your plant. And on the second sl slide here, you can see the symbiotic relationship that's happening. You're creating a good, healthy soil, and the good, healthy soil is what's going to feed that plant. Okay. Now, let's talk, move from the garden pot to your actual garden. And when you're looking at this slide, um, I want you not to be too concerned that you think your um, adult beverage that you might be drinking is making the slide look a little bit blurry. No, it's not. It's me. Um, I took a photograph of a, uh, from a book, took the uh, picture of the book on my phone, sent it to my, my computer and uploaded it onto my PowerPoint. But what I want you to look at here is on the right-hand side where I've got you are here. So this is a cross-section of our soil between Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Now for over 13,000 years, Lake Iroquois lapped against the shores of right up here of the Niagara Scarpment. So it was on top of 450 million year old Queenston shale. So over those 13,000 odd years, you have all that organic material that's in the lake deposited on the floor of um, what, where we now live in Niagara on the lake. So you've got this beautiful acrustine um, Toledo fine sandy loam clay um, that we're planting in here. And if you look right here on this map, and I think this is really fascinating, the 450 year old Queenston shale has poked through. And if any of you remember Coyote's Run, they had their black paw and their red paw wine. And that is the location in Niagara on the lake where the 450 year old Queenston red shale popped through the Lacrustine Toledo um, clay and same grapes um, gave you two very different tastes in wine. So I thought that was a, just a very interesting piece about, about our, 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 the land that we are, are gardening on. So what type of soil do you have? Well, if you're in a, <clears throat> a new subdivision, you may have to talk to your builder to find out where they brought the soil in from. Um, if you're living in the rural areas of Niagara-on-the-Lake, you probably have silty clay um, because that'll be the bottom of the old Lake Iroquois. And again, as I was saying, if you're in, around canopy growth, you may have red fog or clay loam, which is a very, very ancient soil. And if you're living around the various creeks, it could be different again. So how do you find out what your soil is so that you have an understanding and an appreciation of it um, before you plant it? Well, soil is made up of three things, uh, types of soil. You've got clay, you've got silt, and you've got sand. All soil will be made up of some sort of composition of that. So you can feel your sand or your soil and see what it feels like. If you put it, if you make a ball of soil about that size and spray water on it until it gets nice and thick, then you can just start pushing it through your finger like Play-Doh. And the longer the ribbon gets, the more clay is in your soil. So that's a quick, easy way to find out how much clay is in your soil. But an, an, another way you can do it is by taking a mason jar and filling it halfway full with soil from your garden. Now take that soil from two or three different locations and take it down under the first inch or two. So you get the real honest soil that's in your garden. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna get some water And we're going to fill it up with water. And then we're going to give it a good shake. Always hold your finger on the lid when you shake stuff. We've all been there, done that, I'm sure. And what's going to happen is sand, which you can see from the slide, is very large particles, relatively speaking. It's going to fall to the bottom first. And that'll happen quite quickly. You can already see at the bottom, the sand is starting to appear. The next thing that's going to appear is the silt. The, the clay, which are very, very, very fine particles, you can only see them under an electron microscope, 
um, will, will be suspended in the water and it may take 24 hours before the clay has finally settled. And you can have a look at what portions of each are in your soil sample. And that will give you an idea of what kind of soil you have in your property and what you are going to be uh, most successful planting in. So there's two ways to check what your soil is. Um, and, and it's uh, today worked. I was able to dig out some soil from my uh, garden that the uh, um, soil is starting to warm up. If you really, really want more information about what your soil is, the University of Guelph is where you should go. It's $45. They will check your soil pH. They'll check it for phosphorus, potassium, my, um, magnesium. They'll check its salt matter. And they'll check how much organics is in your soil. Um, it takes about three weeks for them to send you your results. Yes, you can buy um, soil test kits in other locations there adequate, but if you want a really good soil analysis, I would really recommend you reach out to the university as well. And the address is there listed by them. Okay, so we've talked about cleaning our pots. We've talked about putting the soil in them. And now we're gonna have to look at what our soil looks like outside. I went out and walked around my yard today um, to have a look at what where there was it possible any ponding. So I'm looking for where the soil may be compacted. And that can happen in the winter time if we end up driving over our lawn or driving over our garden when it's frozen or there's snow on the ground. And you're looking for water ponding or you're looking for very slow infiltration that the water just really isn't getting into your soil very quickly. Um, you might find that the uh, trees are not growing well, your vegetables aren't growing well, your plants aren't uh, flourishing as much as you might hope they would. And that could all because, be because soil is compacted. Now we talked about soil being full of microorganisms and um, clay and, and silt and um, um, sand. And it's all that mixed together that is giving you your be beautiful good soil. About 50% of that is going to be the actual minerals. And the other 50% of that is going to be your porosity. And your porosity is the air spaces that the roots can get into, that the water can get down into, and that is going to allow your um, plants to flourish. If that's all compacted together, you're going to end up with what you have on the right-hand side. You're going to have um, plants that are really desperately trying to get into their soil to get nutrients, but are really, really having a difficult time doing that. So while you all want to get out there today in this beautiful weather and rake and start getting things ready for the, it's too early. It's just too early still. Your garden is too wet. And all you're going to do is create, stepping on that essentially mud is going to compact it all. And that's going to give you more headaches down the road and into the season, and it's just gonna be more difficult to plant. So create pathways to walk on. Have stepping stones in your garden and the places that you usually like to go, or put up trellis or something at the end of your um, garden to keep people off of it, to keep cars from parking on it, um, and just protect that soil a little bit so that you can keep it as healthy as possible. So while I was out walking around my garden today, I was looking at, with horror at all the weeds that had already started. So my creeping Charlie is already like this, and it's, it was in bloom. So little blue flowers had already started. My ground cell, you can see the flowers are already starting because they want to get seeding so that they can give me another five years of heartache. And the bitter crest, good gracious, look at this. It's already huge. And it's going to send up white flowers that are then going to pop all over my yard and uh, cause me grief. So if you want to do something out in your garden now, start looking after the weeds. Um, get them under control so that they don't end up controlling you for the summer. Now you've got different types of weeds. You've got these ones that I just showed you that are just plain annoying, but you've also got noxious weeds. And noxious weeds are defined as something that's gonna cause economic loss, ecological damage, health problems to humans or animals, 
Um, and it's undesirable where it's growing because it's just not safe. Now there's only about 3% of plants that fall into the noxious category. Um, in Ontario, we have 25 of them on that list. And uh, just watch out for those. And I've put the Omafra um, link at the bottom to explain to you what those are and how to deal with them. Invasive, well, invasive weeds are weeds that establish, they persist, and they spread in an ecosystem outside the plant's native range. Um, and these spread quickly. And unfortunately, we have an awful lot of them in Niagara on the lake, of course, Phragmites being um, the biggest headache, I would expect, not only for gardeners as it's appearing in our ditches, but also for the farmers and the grape farmers. If you down um, Niagara Stone Road in front of Jackson Trigg beside um, Stratus, there's a, just a big, big ditch full of Phragmites. And I noticed them all down concession to today. And it's just going to be very difficult to get that under control. So here we've got a uh, bindweed, Phragmites, Lesser celadine, I noticed some of that in the ditch outside of my front yard. Um, we've got Canada thistle, um, plantain, and black medic. And these are some of the more common weeds you're going to see in your garden in your neighborhood. And uh, keep a watch out for them and keep them under control as quickly and as best. And I'm a big proponent of hand pulling rather than. Um, mechanical pulling rather than pesticides, because uh, I just don't think pesticides are good for any of us. This is my idea of a good sense of humor. Okay. The, the kids always used to love to pick dandelions for us all, didn't they? Okay, we've looked at our soil. Let's have a look at some mulch. So mulch, what's the purpose of it? What about dyed mulch? What about arborist mulch? What about landscape fabric? What about coir fiber and coconut hull mulch? Those seems to be two mulches that are getting a lot of attention these days. So let's talk a little bit about why mulch in the first place. Well, um, mulch is going to add minerals to your garden. It's gonna retain water. It's gonna keep your garden cool in the summer and warm in the winter time. It's gonna protect against pests and it's also gonna harbor po pollinators and beneficial insects that are gonna make your garden um, a really natural place for those pollinators. So trace minerals, um, magnesium and calcium are a large part of what you're gonna find in mulch. They're gonna to add to your soil. And again, we're working with our organisms and our micronutrients in the soil. So it's all part of keeping a, a healthy vitamin pill, if you will. And unlike soil amendments, mulches are materials laid on top of your soil. You're not digging mulches in. Mulch has nitrogen in it. Your plant wants to bind the nitrogen. You don't want the nitrogen in the mulch going into the soil and combat, combating with the uh, plant material for that nitrogen. You can use leaves as mulch. Um, just make sure you shred them first. You can either use a shredding lawnmower or um, whatever, whatever works for you. Um, leaf blowers have a vacuum setting that you can use. Um, a light layer of small, thin leaves over the, the garden work fine. Maple leaves are ideal because they break down very quickly. Oak leaves, not so much. There's lignin in oak leaves and they provide more of a trap and and hold the moisture in the soil and you end up with molds and other unhealthy and unwanted things. So best to try and uh, use um, things that don't have lignin in them. So stay away from the oats. And adding too thick of a layer of leaves can block the air and water from penetrating into the ground. So just a nice couple inches on top and uh, you're all set to go. Um, mulches can come in different colors. And I have a real concern with that because colored mulch is often made out of um, wood that has been, it's secondary wood, it's wood that has been um, broken down, shredded, 
and then died. And a lot of this wood is CCA wood. So it's got copper and arsenic in it. And then you're adding that to your soil. Sure, a, a black mulch might look pretty, a red mulch might look pretty, but you have to think about the health of your soil if you're taking um, dyed, um, poorly constructed wood to start with and adding that to your soil. You're not doing anything to help your, um, your soil. And if anything, you're, you're gonna harm it. So dyed mulch doesn't break down. It doesn't enrich the soil as much as good mulch should. It leaches dye with the contaminants. We talked about the chromium, copper and arsenic that would be in the others. And it puts that in the soil and it harms the beneficial insects that may be living in your soil harms the earthworms and can harm the plants themselves. So these wood mulches um, actually rob the soil of their nitrogen and uh, outcompete the plants for the nitrogen that harm your plants the most. So while they look pretty, perhaps not your best choice. Quar, what is quar? Quar is the outside of a coconut. So that's all this stuff that when the coconut is processed, ends up being used for mulch. All well and good, um, but the amount of water that is used to make that product is quite remarkable. And it's still left with a lot of salt in the quar. So have to you know, consider what matters to you um, as far as being ecologically and environmentally sound if you look at that as an option. The other one is cocoa hulls. Um, smell great because who doesn't like the smell of chocolate all around you, but they are toxic to dogs and they are very expensive. So if you've got dogs um, in your home, in your neighborhood, might be something you choose to stay away from. Stones. Some people love to um, put stones around their garden, mulch around their trees with stones. Again, can be aesthetically pretty but two problems. One, you're now weeding through stones, which is a little bit of a heart headache. And you've also got compaction going on. So the weight of the stones themselves are weighing down on your soil. And we just talked about um, the negative effects that that can have on your soil. Arborist mulch. Now this is something I just love. It's usually free. So if you've got a neighbor or you see the town out cut, cutting down trees and shredding them with their chipper, ask if they'll dump some of it on, their, on your driveway. Arborist mulch is great. It comes in, it's in various sizes and it's got the leaves and it's got the twigs and it's got the, the wood in it, the larger chips. And all of that sits beautifully in your garden. It's not creating a thick, tight layer and it most likely isn't gonna cost you anything to purchase it, well, to not purchase it. You can just have them dump it on the driveway. Um, studies have found that wood chips are one of the best performers in terms of retaining, uh, retaining moisture, temperature moderation, weed control, and sustainability. And again, free is the best price around, so uh, keep your eyes open for them in the spring. Okay, cleanup. This is one of my favorite little topics. I'm gonna to clean up our, our yards now because none of us did it in the uh, autumn because we were looking out for our pollinators, right? Okay, so we didn't clean up in the fall because we were busy doing other things. And we kept saying we should have, but we didn't. And now we're patting ourselves on the back for not. So what does the cleaning up your yard really mean? Well, for me, it means two things. It means be nice, and leaves, leave the leaves. Because there's all kinds of little creatures overwintering in your garden, in your fallen leaves, in the uh, dead plant material that you haven't cut back. And you are doing them all a favor by leaving your things in your garden until the spring. Insects overwinter in your garden. Leaf litter provides hiding spaces for them and food for your beneficial, beneficial insects. 
and they um, they need temperatures above 10 degrees for at least a week before they're ready to wake up and get out in the world and get on with their life. So you may have seen some flies and some bees and some wasps flying around in the last day or two. So they're starting to awaken, but there's still going to be cold weather ahead of us and there's going to be a lot more bee activity um, in, the, in the days and weeks to come. So if you rake everything up now, you're literally throwing away this year's pollinators. Um, there was a gentleman once telling me that uh, he always cleaned his um, lawn up in the autumn and he had just as many pollinators as his neighbors who didn't. Yeah, because bees and pollinators don't worry about property lines and they were flying over his property as much as anybody else's. And I had to diplomatically say to him, yeah, but if you'd left yours, just think there'd be even more pollinators flying around. And he was quite surprised to have thought of that. Um, in the bottom right corner is Fred. So Fred is my little carpenter bee. This is my pool shed. And uh, you can see that he's absolutely covered in pollen. He took a good corner of my pool shed and made it look a little bit like Swiss cheese, but that was okay. Um, because 20 years ago, um, in my previous house, we were eating outside and sawdust started falling down from the gazebo above us. And I look up and there's this big black bum staring at me and digging this beautiful round hole. And I'm aghast because I've got children and oh no, they're gonna be stung. So I, I go and I fill it with putty and the next day, same thing's happening again. So I put duct tape over it and no, this little guy was determined so I still feel guilty about this. I got out the raid and I sprayed it. The next morning, all these carpenter bees were on the side of my house because I just wrecked their habitat and I sprayed them too. And I'm still, now that I know better, I'm just so remorseful for having done that because carpenter bees are the sign that you have a fabulously fabulously balanced garden and that it, like it should be and it's a welcome welcome sign in your garden so just love them and let them live here you can see um, one of our native bees coming out of the ground so most of our bees our native bees live in the soil um, honeybees are not native to uh, Canada but most of our native bees live in the soil so when you mulch, mulch your garden, but do some empty spaces. And one of the easiest things have a nice cozy home for the winter so that they can overwinter successfully. Um, not just bees, you've got ground beetles, centipedes, millipedes, pill bugs, spiders. And all of these creatures help break down the organic material in your garden to make your soil the best it can be. So be nice. And leave your healthy plants standing over the winter time. Let them just dry out because here you can see the little hole here. Well, this one you can't see as much. So the little bees live in here. Little wasps, little bees, little centipedes will make this their home. And if you cut it down in the fall and get rid of it, they don't have a home. You've taken that away from it. And if you cut it now, you're taking those little bees and you're throwing them out. And again, getting rid of that great biodiversity that you could have in your, in your yard. This is actually a picture I took on the Heritage Trail near East West Line. These are wasp galls. And these trees were just planted, I believe this past year by the Heritage Trail Committee. And already nature has taken up homes in them. Perhaps all these holes don't look so pretty, but you've, you've got lovely little homes happening. The, the um, galls will fall onto the ground with the leaves. They'll overwinter in that little pile of leaves. And in the springtime, they'll eat their way out of their galls and uh, they'll be part of the beneficial insects that make up the uh, environment around these um, grapevines in that part of Niagara on the Lake. Now we've talked about bees, you've probably seen this before. 
Um, I'll give you a minute to have a look at this. The uh, di different yellow stripy things that we have in our garden. You may have seen the hoverflies now, they're out. The only ones, of course, that are gonna give you any grief are the yellow jackets, um, because they really are just jerks. And let me, fun fact, let me tell you why they're jerks. Um, yellow jacket's job is to feed the queen's um, newborn. And that's what they do. They spend all their time feeding the queen's newborns. And then those little bees or, or those little yellow jackets grow up to be big yellow jackets. And now, and they're all male, these males are unemployed. So we got a bunch of unemployed males with nothing to do on their hands. So they, their point of existence doesn't exist anymore. So they start stinging us because they're jerks. Okay, so now we've got know where our soil is at. We've got our pots ready. We've got our garden ready. But how are our garden tools? Because we want to make sure that they're clean and that they're sharp before we dig in to this year's garden. They are here for our garden tools. So not all of you are going to have gardening trowels that look like mine. Um, this is a very special one given to me by a special friend, but I don't expect you to all have golden garden, garden trowels. However, I do expect you've all got something that looks like this. You want to make sure that they're clean, that there's no dirt on them from last year, and uh, that they're sharp and ready to go. So getting your um, tools sharp, if you've got a um, file, you're going to go at them on an angle like this. And the trick that I use to make sure that my um, tools are being sharpened properly is I take a sh black sharpie and I put the I put a black line of sharpie along the edge of my garden tool and then as I file I'm taking the sharpie off and I know that I've got the whole trowel done when all my sharpie has disappeared. Something I'm going to try this year um, but haven't tried yet is a rotary tool. So this is, I'm just going to hook it up to my drill and see how it works. It says that it's going to be able to sharpen all my garden tools for me a whole lot quicker than using my file. So I'm going to try that. And uh, Julia, if it works, I'll put it on the buy nothing, not all library so people can borrow it and uh, see if it gives them any success. Quick pause as we go back and look at our soil. So you can see here, you can see the sand down here, you can see my silt here, and you can see the clay that's still suspended in the water, and you can see the or some organic material still at the top. So that's what my clay up in, or my soil up in Queenston is going to look like at the end of the day. So I'll have a better idea of what I'm gardening. With. And you will have seen that I gave you a gardening triangle. And you, Niagara on the Lake is basically the top half of that gardening triangle as, the, as far as types of soil. So when you have a look at that triangle with your, your soil, you'll be able to see whether you've got sandy loam, clay loam, exactly what your soil type may be. Okay, back to our tools. So we're going to make sure our tools are sharp. We're going to make sure they're clean. If you're gardening, let's say down at Red Roof Retreat, because you've been promising them that you're going to put in a sensory garden for them, you want to make sure you've cleaned that your tools well before you bring that back to your own garden, because you don't know what you're bringing back to your own garden or taking to someone else's if, you're, if your tools aren't completely clean. So always wash them. Again, nine parts water, one part bleach. Um, give them a good wash and a good rinse. So what you might want to use, detergent, um, biodegradable, your garden hose, of course, you're doing this outside, some rags, cleaning, you're gonna want um, steel wool, scrub brush, wire brushes, 
sandpaper to get your um, trowels as clean as they can be. Um, or you can also take them to the Saturday market. That's right. There's um, Saturday market, they sharpen tools as well. So that's an option for you this spring, assuming we get a Saturday market. Um, linseed oil is what I use to keep my tools keep, um, operating as best as, I, as they can. I just find that that really works nicely. And of course, always wear gloves while you're doing this and always wear um, an eye mask protector so that you don't uh, damage your eyes and end up with um, dirt and grime and bits of pieces in your eye. Okay, keeps telling me it's unstable. Okay, pruning. Pruning is something that we have to think about carefully. All too often we want to run out with our with our clippers and just clip it into a nice shape so that it looks good. Not how we should approach pruning. So the first thing you want to do when you're pruning is prune for disease. Have a look and see if your plant is healthy. I was looking at my persithia today and there's a little gall forming on the end here. So I took, well, I just picked it off because it was small, but you're going to be pruning for disease. You want to make sure that um, insect damage and disease to the tree are removed from the tree. Um, some species like a dwarf Alberta spruce, spruce may start to revert back to what it used to be. So anytime you've got a plant that's reverting, you want to get rid of that um, branch to keep it true to what you purchased. Um, once you prune for disease, you want to look for branches that cross each other, branches that are growing down. Those are the things you want to get rid of next. Then you can start looking at shape and saying, okay, I don't want this growing over into my driveway, over the roof of my house, and start pruning for shape at that point in time. And the late dormant season, which is what we're moving into now, is the best time to start pruning. So now is the time you want to start going out, looking at your plants, making as, as, some assessments as to what needs to be done. You're looking for disease. You're looking for branches crossing over each other. You're looking for um, branches growing down. And you're looking for the shape you want to ultimately let your shrub or your tree grow into. Okay, so we talked about pruning to um, promote plant health. So that's the first thing we're going to do. Um, we want all of our trees, we want all of our shrubs to be healthy. We're going to remove any of the dead branches, the dying branches, branches that rub together. Um, and we can start doing that now. Down in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see some of the different equipment you may have to use. You've got secateurs and loppers and different um, um, saws that you might want to use to give your plants and your shrubs nice clean cuts. Because remember, we've got everything nice and sharp and clean now. So when we do our cutting, we're not worrying about transferring disease. So when you are pruning, if it's a big trunk or a big branch rather, you're gonna come under first and then cut the top. And that's gonna prevent the branch from just breaking and ripping down the collar of your tree or shrub. In the bottom left, you can see what a branch collar looks like. So that's right here where the branch joins the main, the bigger branch or the main part of the tree or shrub. You don't want to cut it here. You want to cut it right here. And you can see just where the swelling is before it goes on to the bigger branch in the tree. You're going to make your cut here because your tree is going to heal easier and it's not going to have as big a problem fighting any diseases that may arise at the open wound. Okay, quick pruning guide. So um, anytime, dead, diseased, or crossing branches, get rid of them. But when are you going to 
to other trees. Any shrub or tree that is going to bloom in the spring, you're going to um, prune them after they bloom because they've set their flower on the previous year's growth. So if you go out and cut them now, you're cutting off this year's growth. And there's a list of them. Um, you can have a quick view. Azaleas, Duxias, um, Brasithias, Hydrangeas, Lilacs, Mock Orange, Rhododendrons, Viburnums, Vigilias is our you know, early spring one. Summer bloomers, you cut them after the um, season has ended, so late winter, early spring, and you're getting them ready because they are going to bloom on new seasons growth. So um, Abelia, the be um, beautyberry, butterfly bush, caryopsis, um, hydrangea particulata, hydrangea arborescence, nine barks, roses, and spireas. So you're going to bloom, uh, cut them now so that they'll have a nice shape to them and be healthy for blooming um, later in the season. Roses. Roses, of course, have their own um, song that they dance to because a rose by any other name is still a rose, but it's still like to be pruned different than every other shrub. Now we're fortunate, fortunate that we have Palatine roses um, in our community. Um, I would say go over and talk to them and they will give you a beautiful rundown on exactly how to deal with the type of rose you may have because there are many different types of roses. You've got floribundas, you've got climbers, you've got um, low growing, tall growing. Um, so if you know what type of rose you have, you'll be off to a better start on how to prune it. So there, to, there we talk about pruning lightly, moderately, and giving it an absolute hard pruning um, to rejuvenate it completely. And I've been looking at my roses right now, and now they're pretty much ready to be um, given a good prune. The leaves are just about ready to open and uh, I'm going to go out there this weekend and have a little chat with them about where we're locking them off. And finally, let's talk a little bit about getting edgy. So you've got this beautiful, beautiful garden soil, you're ready to plant it up and you just want to put that final little um, edge to it to give it a beautiful final look. So how are you going to do that? Well, again, top right corner, we've got a really attractive looking garden and it's done with stones and pebbles. And sure, that looks really great the day it's done, but there's going to be backsplash when it rains and there's going to be weeds coming up through that. And again, you're compacting your soil. So you're not allowing your soil to be the best that it can be. Conversely, on the top left, you've got um, nice edging done where they've just taken their edger, so something like this, and edged the garden with it. So you're just going, you're just stepping on the edge, flipping it up, and throwing the uh, soil into the garden and getting rid of the grass that you've dug up. Um, you can also use a straight edge shovel, which will work faster um, because you can actually walk walk on the shovel walk on the shovel with one leg and just walk with the other leg and you can just on the edge going down the side of the garden. You can edge with anything you like. People have used um, bricks and cement. Um, some people are very creative and create their own um, garden edging but it, you're really just limited by your imagination, your aesthetic, your cost, and how much work it's going to be for you at the end of the day. So now we've got our beautiful gardens ready to be planted up. And here is you in beautiful Niagara on the Lake, living in beautiful zones 7A. Um, we're very fortunate in Ontario. We're, we're the warmest spot down with um, Kent Windsor. Um, beautiful 7A climate. And uh, now you're going to look for species that you can plant in your garden that are going to grow in a cozy, warm, um, 7A climate. 
I've put two links down here. Um, the first one is plants that grow in the Niagara region and grow well. And then this one's a fun one. It's Farm is Almanac of Plants That Grow in Zone 7A. And you can click on the picture of the uh, plant and it'll tell you everything you want to know about it if you want to get some good ideas. Whoops, too fast. So there you have it. Um, our last date, um, sorry, our average date of our last spring frost is the end of April. And I know that sounds early, but um, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture says that April 30th in Zone 7A in Ontario, 50% of the time, there will be no frost after the date. 25% risk of frost seven days after that. But two weeks out, there's only a 10% chance. So when people are saying, when should I plant? When should I plant? Keep that in mind, depending on what you're planting, and whether you're putting in something that can take a cool weather and a light frost or not. We're fortunate that a frost-free period is 160 to 170 days, and every year that seems to be growing. So we seem to be having a, a longer frost-free period. If we think back to the last few September and Octobers, and even into November, we've had some really, really warm weather. So there you go. You're ready to deal with your, your yard. You're ready to um, start thinking about cleaning up, but you want to go out and say good morning and good afternoon to all the pollinators and beneficial insects that are still um, living there. We have a lot of butterflies here that overwinter. Um, they, they put about 30% antifreeze into their bodies um, and just sort of hang out in uh, your foliage that you've left. Um, over the winter. So you're doing them a favor by not cleaning up just yet. So just hold on for a few more, few more days, maybe a few more weeks. So there you go. You're ready to start um, getting your garden ready to uh, plant up. And I know someone who would be more than happy to dig in your garden for some ball tosses. So if uh, you need some help, let me know. In two and a bit weeks, on Sunday, March 28th, it's the worm moon. Native Americans call the March full moon um, because, of the, because of the worm trails that appear in the newly thawed ground. This is the last full moon of winter. So it's time now to start thinking about digging your dirt because you know what they say? Gardeners, we know the best way. So thank you. There we go, Deb. Okay. Thank you so much, Betty. Um, there are some questions. Okay. So I will, if you don't mind, I'll read them to you. Yep. Okay. And um, there's some, there's about nine or ten of them. And, uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how it goes. If we don't get to all of your questions, please feel free to email them to me, and then Betty, I'm sure, will be willing to um, answer you by email. And just as a reminder, that was so much really good information and i could i can sense panic that you can't get it all down it will be on our youtube channel you just have to go to the library's website scroll right down to the bottom click on the the youtube icon give us a few days to get it up there but it will be there i promise that was yeah that was wonderful okay let's get to the questions julia would like to know could you please comment on vegan fertilizer we don't want to use animal products and we used phytoplankton soil enhancer last year, but don't know how good it is. Okay, so she's interested in, one more time. Vegan fertilizer, not interested in using animal products, have used phytoplankton soil enhancer, okay. but not sure about it. I, I don't know anything about um, that type of soil enhancer. I'm happy to do some research and find out for, for her. Um, a lot of people um, use a lot of plant products. So corn, corn husks um, is, is something that can be used. Um, yeah, Julia, let me, let me have a little bit of look, looking for you. Um, you. You don't wanna go to cattle manure, even though that's mostly hay, okay. Um, yeah, I'll have to look up some, something that might work. Sawdust, maybe you could consider sawdust. Um, I saw two big piles of sawdust on um, the 
in session two today, and I'm curious to see how they're going to spread that on their fields. So maybe sawdust is something you could try, cocoa shells, grass clippings. Grass clippings you might want to try on a lot of nitrogen. So just be careful of that. Pine needles, um, leaves, of course, newspapers. Um, after you've finished reading all of our local newspapers, maybe you, you could try putting that down for a mulch. Um, yeah, so I hope that helps. Um, I'll Let me do a little bit of research and see what else I can find for you. Okay, moving on. Should we be, con so we'll talk about, there's a few about mulch. So we're going back to the mulch. Should we be concerned about arborist mulch if they're cutting down the tree due to disease or insect? Really, really, really good question. So yes, gypsy moths are a problem in various parts of Ontario. Um, you may have seen the gypsy moth, um, little beigey um, golfing on the side of a lot of maple trees. So. You don't want to bring gypsy moths onto your property. If they're cutting down um, emerald ash or ash because of the emerald ash borer, you certainly don't want to bring that onto your property. So yeah, just be careful, but it's generally speaking, it's not a bad, uh, bad choice. Some people want to stay away from black walnut because of the juglone in the, um, is, is a chemical inside of the black walnut that can cause some plants not to grow well underneath it. So some people like to stay away from black walnut. Um, that's a little bit of a controversial thing because a lot of stuff will grow under black walnut. So yeah, good point, good, good observation. Okay, another one about mulch. I was always told not to use wood chip mulch as it attracts carpenter ants to the house. What's your opinion about that? Wow, carpenter ants. I guess I just say keep my eye out for carpenter ants. I don't have carpenter ants. I've never seen them around here. Um, I'd be curious to other people's thoughts and comments as to whether they have them. Um, no, I just I so got no opinion about that. Landscaping fabric. Yeah. So you can get different thicknesses of landscaping fabric, and again, it's people have different opinions about this. I used a lot of landscaping fabric on my property. I used two bolts of it. I mean bolts. Mm -hmm. um, and I used the really, really thick stuff. The thin stuff that you can buy at the dollar store, just it's, it's a waste of money because it's just not going to do anything. So the thing with landscaping fabric, yes, if you're putting mulch on top of your landscaping fabric, um, the biodiversity is still going to happen. You're still going to have the micronutrients going through the uh, landscape fabric and into your soil and creating a good health soil. Some people don't like to use a uh, landscaping fabric because they say as the mulch breaks down, you're just creating now a nice little home for weed seeds to take hold and the weeds are going to start growing on top of your mulch, so uh, on top of your landscape fabric, so what's the point? Um, when should we remove the mulch? When should we? Well, hopefully you put mulch down over the winter, and you're getting ready to um, plant new. New. You're going to pull your mulch back before you plant, and then you're going to put your mulch back on top of your garden. Now you're not going to put your mulch right up against your plant. Um, either the, the new stuff you've planted or your shrubs or your trees. If you put it right up against your trees and your shrubs against the wood, it's going to be perpetually damp and that's going to attract problems, right? You're going to end up with mold, you're going to end up with a weak bark and you don't want that. So you want to stay a few inches away from the actual trunk of the tree or the shrub. Same with um, plants, you don't want to get it too close because then the earwigs start taking up residence and it sort of gets unpleasant. Um, but but uh, you want to keep your mulch on your soil um, once you planted it, absolutely. And just keep adding more. You probably only want a couple inches. You don't want to get really thick mulch. If your mulch gets very thick, you're doing more harm than good because now the water's not getting in as deeply and as quickly. Um, you're creating a more of a damp culture. You want to create just a nice little barrier 
that is going to allow for a nice microorganism symbiotic relationship. Okay, moving on to garden tools. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on uh, hand forks versus hand trowels? A customer of mine won't let us use any shovels in the gardens as it ruins the roots of the plants. I personally love my hand fork. I love hand forks. And hand forks, um, you're not going to hit a rock and sort of bang your, your joints. And as I'm getting older, I'm finding that I don't want the, you know, the elbow being banged around and what have you. I love forks. Absolutely. 100% love them. But I also love my trowel. My trowel tells me um, how deep I'm planting. It's got measurements on it, so I can use that as a guide for when I'm planting bulbs, when I'm putting in perennials. I find that very useful. Um, and trees and plants are pretty resilient. You're not going to do a lot of damage to their roots by um, a shovel or two digging in the soil. They're resilient. They'll bounce back. A lot, a lot of plants, not a lot, many climbing plants, climbing vines, um, people will use a trowel, a, a shovel to cut the root just to keep the vine under control a little bit so that it spends part of its season readdressing its root situation and not being as prolific. I'm thinking of wisteria as an example of that or trumpet vines. What do you use to remove sap from tools? Sap, um, Gooby Gone. Gooby Gone works for everything, but just make sure you've got the Gooby Gone off your trowel before you start using it. And hot water, elbow grease, Brillo pad, SOS pad. All right, moving on to, I just wanna make sure I haven't forgotten anything, pruning. When should a dogwood be pruned? What kind of dogwood? Yeah, so lots of different types of dogwood. We've got... Paula, if you can unmute yourself and give us a little more information about the dogwood. Hi, Rubber tree. Um, I've got uh, a number of dogwood bushes, not trees, uh, not flowering, but they're more dogwood bushes. What so the variegate, variegated, that type. So I missed the first part of what you said. I have more of a variegated type of a bush. It's not a flowering dogwood tree, but I have a number of dogwood uh, bushes which have been described to me as being variegated. Okay, so it's it's um, a green and a little bit of a white in the leaf? Yeah. Yeah, um, now's a good time to go out and have a look at them. Um, you wanna first again, take out anything that's diseased or dead. Um, then you want any branches that are growing down or floppy or just not growing in a healthy way. And then prune for um, shape. Never, ever, 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 Paula, take out more than one third of a shrub when you plant it, uh, prune it in a season. Thank you. Hope that helps. Let's move on. Um, hang on. I am a new gardener, gardener and I have a lily of the valley, fire mountain bushes. When do I prune those? Are we talking about pruning the lily of the valley? Yes. Erin, you're the new gardener. Can you give us a little more information about the lily of the valley? Give me one second. Sure. It's, um, again, I'm a brand new gardener, so I planted them about oh. two years ago. Oh, Karen, can we stop right there? You're not going to like this. Okay. Lily of the Valley is considered an invasive species, and gardeners are encouraged to rip it out of the gardens and not to plant it. And I would love to do a um, talk at some point about um, 
just that about the invasive species that we are planting in our gardens in the Niagara region and the damage that it's doing to our ecosystem. Because invasive species, um, and I, I, I'm thinking of things like periwinkle, pachysandra, lily of the valley, goutweed, things that we probably, in English ivy, things that we probably all have in our gardens are considered invasive species in Ontario and we're asked to remove them from our gardens. And as master gardeners, that's one of our um, big songs is about removing invasive species. Um, and it was a conversation I had regularly with Maury Gardens. And Maury Gardens' comment to me was, well, they, I went in there one day and there were this big trays of periwinkle and lily of the valley all coming in. And I said, I gave them the whole invasive species thing. And they said, well, people buy them. And we like to give people what they want. So I think a lot of it's about educating us all about um, what is and is not a good thing to put in our garden, because it's more than just the plant itself. It's about what you are doing to the ecosystem in the soil, because these invasive species absolutely change the composition of our of the makeup in our soil. And it's about the pollinators that they attract. So they do not attract native pollinators, which leave our native pollinators looking for food, starving, they're hungry because we're planting things that they're not attracted to. Fun fact, earthworms are not native to Ontario or not native to Canada. Of the 19 different species of earthworms in Canada, only two of them are native. Um, and yet we think of earthworms as good for our garden. You know, they've been here long enough that, yeah, they're, they're, they do have their purpose, but they have changed the, uh, the soil composition in Ontario. So I'm sorry. Um, that's not what you want to hear. <laughs> well, uh, Maury Garden suggested I buy those. So uh, yeah. <laughs> being a new gardener. I mean, I love Maury Gardens. No. They're, they're just absolutely lovely to bits and not to single them out. It's you know, gardening centers everywhere. They, they want to give people what people want. And I think we have perhaps an obligation as responsible stewards of our land to be more aware of and choose carefully what we do put in the garden. Okay, thank you. Just bear with me, there was one more. Oh, here it is. I would like to know how to get my U hedge to grow up versus laterally and should or could we use fertilizer sticks to enhance its growth rate? Well, there's lots of different types of use. Do you know what kind of you you have? If you have a hicks you, it's going to be growing straight up. If you have a weeping you, it's never gonna grow straight up. So um, I guess one question is, do you know what type of you you have? Fertilizer sticks, um, I don't like them because they're sticking a deep concentration of fertilizer in one spot. And it's going to have a negative effect again on all the soil microorganisms around that stick of fertilizer. And it's not going to be distributed evenly through your plant. Um, but I guess the first question would be what type of you do you have planted? Because sometimes we think we're putting in the perfect plant for a perfect spot. And then after a little while we went, oh, it's not doing what I thought it was doing. And it turns out it's not that the plant is doing anything wrong. It's just that we didn't realize what the plant was going to do. One more question. I have a very mature clematis. Can it be divided? Can it be done? There are three different types of clematis. And again, it'll depend what type of clematis you have um, and when it can be divided. You can take a softwood cutting of most clematis and we, we plant them under, um, you know, putting it under a jar and putting it in the warm soil. Um, and you could have good success, absolutely. And if you want, if you want to um, leave your info with Debbie, I'd be happy to unpack with you what kind of clematis you have and how to do that. <laughs>